All righty. Well, we'll go ahead and crank her up here. All right, welcome to Expedition Church of the Triad. This is our Wednesday night meeting, and uh, we're going to be getting into the Word of God tonight. Trust your, uh, you have your Bibles ready and got your fingers warmed up where you can <laughs> follow along. We're not going to do any, uh, you know, scripture uh, tracking with a lot of different scriptures, but the ones we're going to look at, I think we'll. Uh, we'll dig into pretty deep here. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Pastor is enjoying his anniversary today. And uh, I think it's today. What is today? That is their anniversary? Yeah. So uh, they're often enjoying that. And we are glad that he has the opportunity. He and, and uh, Pastor Janie have the opportunity to get away and do that. Praise the Lord. So uh, let's pray and we'll get into the word here tonight, and then receive the offering later. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come together and receive from your word. Father, we just believe the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us and direct us tonight. We know that he is the teacher of the church, and so, Father, we just make ourselves available to receive from your word. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's talk about a topic that I've been doing a little bit of study on. Uh, it's, a, it's an unusual <laughs> message, and uh, who knows, we may branch off in several different directions before it's over with. Pastor said I have not only tonight, but next Wednesday. So if we need to develop this further, we will. If not, we may have another topic next Wednesday, so praise the Lord. But I want to talk about a topic that I'm calling Genuine Christianity. Genuine Christianity. And uh, in order to kind of define that and know what we're talking about, the word genuine, the definition is truly what something is said to be or authentic. Okay? What something is said to be, in other words, in its original definition, or authentic. And the reason I want to call it genuine Christianity is because there's too many things that it, that's being taught in these days that isn't really genuine. It's not authentic. It's not true to the Word of God. Now, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, and much of what I heard doctrinally in the Southern Baptist Church was good and was authentic. But there were things <laughs> that uh, just didn't line up with the Word of God. It was based more on tradition. And so as I came along, of course, as a young kid and teenager, uh, I just assumed, well, you know, these folks know better than I do. <laughs> and so I just fell in and believed what was taught in the Southern Baptist Church. And like I say, for the most part, they had salvation down. You know, they, they knew what it meant to be born again. They knew that just going to church and... Uh, having your mom and dad be part of the church wasn't enough. You had to have a personal experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, they knew about, you know, as Pastor talks about Baptist in the Romans Road, go through the Romans Road to salvation, find out how to be born again. And all that's fine. That's all good. And it is scriptural because it is based on scripture, obviously. And so that part of it I had no issue with. But then down the road... <laughs> I went to a full gospel businessmen's meeting in Raleigh, North Carolina, and heard about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues. And wow, I jumped right on that because they gave me all of the scripture, they laid it out in the Word, and I said, wow, this is all. I mean, you know, one thing about Baptists, you can say for Baptists, they're big on saying, if it's in the I believe it according to the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation with no changes. And uh, so I just said, well, it's in the Word of God. I believe it. And based on that, uh, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, spoke in other tongues. Well, I went back to my Baptist church. <laughs> and, uh, you know, first Baptist church, praise the Lord. And my pastor at that time uh, was a soft-spoken, gentle, uh, kind man. And he let me preach back in those days very often. Now, I was a kid. I was, by that time, 
let's see, 73, I would have been a junior in high school, and yet they let me teach. And so uh, I asked the pastor, I said, Pastor, can I share on Sunday night? I just, I tell you, some exciting things that happened in my life. I would just like to share that. He said, sure, Brother Bill. <laughs> and so I came out, and that Sunday night, said, we're going to open our Bibles to Acts chapter 2. <laughs> and here's this whole Baptist church listening to me talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. Well, the pastor sat on the back row, and he was just sitting there white as a sheet. <laughs> he was like, whoa! So he, he let me teach till I finished. And, uh, you know, praise the Lord, I gave everybody an opportunity to receive the baptism. And some ladies came down front, and he said, take them to the back, take them to the back. So we went in the back to the Sunday school room. I prayed for them, and they, they spoke in other tongues. And uh, so the next Sunday night, I mean, I was, boy, I was excited. I preaching the word, wow, you know. So I come back the next Sunday night, and he proceeds to jump in and teach on how all that had passed away. And the speaking in tongues was of the devil. And on and on and on. And I just sat there. I was crushed. I mean, I thought, whoa, wait a minute. What is this about? So obviously, <laughs> what I had taught based on the word was not according to their tradition. And because of that, he shot it down. Well, I was not dissuaded. <laughs> and so as time went by, uh, as Brother Hagin said, I received the left foot of fellowship from among the Baptists and ended up, a uh, friend of mine and I, started a church there in Denton, North Carolina, and uh, we started teaching the Word, and all kinds of exciting things happened. Miracles took place. I mean, it was exciting back in those days. We're talking the late 1970s. So it was back a, back a ways. And this was even before I heard about, you know, the Word of Faith messages. Before I was just beginning to hear a little bit of Kenneth Copeland and a little bit of Kenneth Hagin, just a little back then. And I hadn't kind of put it all together yet. But uh, at any rate, as I began to learn and as my, my buddy Ted began to learn, he was pastor, um, you know, we began to teach the Word, begin to teach faith, begin to teach according to everything that we had received. And like I say, a lot of exciting things happened. But the thing is, when we taught what the Word said, now, pastors pointed this out recently in a lot of what he's teaching on the Baptism of the Holy Ghost right now and on Sundays, uh, and that is uh, Mark chapter 16, where it says that, you know, uh, these signs will follow them that believe, they shall speak in new tongues. They shall cast out devils, they'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. All those things. Well, we believe that, we preach that, and signs followed the word preached. And so we saw people speaking in other tongues. We saw people healed supernaturally, miraculously. We saw all those things happen in that little church that we had started, and we were experiencing New Testament Bible, genuine Christianity. And because we were preaching the Word, and it was being confirmed. So I kind of thought at the time, why didn't the Southern Baptist Church receive this? Now obviously a few did, a few ladies did, and they eventually came to our church and so forth, you know. I mean, you got to come where there's fellowship around what you believe. And, uh, but yeah, I thought, why did these other folks receive it? Well, they received based on what they heard. And what they heard on a consistent basis challenged what we were preaching based on the Word. Now, I know how that can happen because when I first heard the teaching of the baptism of the Holy Spirit at that full gospel business men's meeting, I'd never heard that message before. And I mean, I'd read the Bible through several times, and particularly the New Testament, several times. And um, when it would go into Acts chapter 2 and you know, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in other tongues, it was kind of like it just went, <laughs> you know, I didn't see it. it. It was like it wasn't there. It just faded out. And so when, when I heard the Happy Hunters and George Otis preach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it was like somebody had taken that and just stuck it in my Bible. I saw it in there. 
And like I said, I'd read it before, but I never saw it come to life. I never saw it clearly. And it was like the light got turned on when I saw that. And so when we talk about genuine Christianity, the key to it is it's got to be based on the Word. What you see in the Word, what you hear when you hear the Word taught. You know, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And as I've said many times, I like to put it this way, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the Word of God because it is an ongoing, uh, present tense, hearing of the word. Not what you've heard. Now what you've heard is good, but it's what you're hearing. What you're hearing in the right now. You know, so as I heard the word concerning the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. As I heard the word concerning faith, I began to operate in faith. As I heard the word concerning prosperity and financial blessing, I began to operate in that. You, you believe, you have faith for what you're hearing, okay? And we've heard that. We know that. But the thing is, why do people get off? Now, we know these last and last days that we're living in, I just personally believe that. You can, you can think whatever you will, you know, I'm not going to have any falling out of, on, about it. But I think a lot of Christians understand that we're in the last of the last days. There's just so much going on, so much you see happening that it just, I don't know, to me, it's fairly obvious. Could be wrong. Again, not building any doctrines. But I just think that it is. Well, we know that the Word of God says that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And we know that in the last days, there will be those who will have itching ears to hear things that they want to hear rather than what the Bible specifically teaches. In other words, they'll begin to to hear things and look for things to be taught that tickles their ears that they want to hear. I saw something on Facebook that I had to kind of grin about. I, I understand what the guy's saying. He said, you know, it's hard to hear God when you've already decided what he's going to say. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of people like that, you know. Uh, now, God, this is the way it is. Is that right? Well, okay, good. You know, I mean, you've made up your mind. So it's kind of easy to fall into that. And that's really kind of what we're talking about when we talk about itching ears. You, you want to hear somebody teach what makes you feel good about yourself. And in order to kind of cover this correctly, I need to step back just a couple of steps and say, that when I say that, I'm not talking about the, the real you, the human spirit. See, we are a spirit. We have a soul. We live in a physical body. So in that sense, that there's a theological term called tripartite man. That's a very long way of saying that you're made up of three areas. You are a spirit man, and for you to be absent from your body, the real you, the spirit man, to be absent from your body is to be present with the Lord. So when this body ceases to work and function, you don't just cease to exist. You leave this body and go into whatever <laughs> you have prepared for, <laughs> either by believing the Word of God and receiving Jesus as the Lord going to heaven, or people who are not born again follow their spiritual father. Jesus said, ye are of your father the devil, they end up in hell. Now, God didn't send them there. They were already on the track. <laughs> they were already on that journey. What he did is he provided a means of escape, a way out through Jesus. So he's not sending people to hell, but hell is their ultimate end result if they don't receive Jesus as Lord. And so, uh, if they're following after the devil, they tend to operate on a level, because they're not operating from a spirit level, they operate on a level of just mind, will, and emotions, the soulish realm, and the physical body. And if you do that, what's going to happen is you're going to lean to the flesh. And that's the key to this whole study that we're talking about here, about genuine Christianity, is if it is not genuine Christianity, it is because 
it's leaning to the flesh. It's leaning to what appeals to the soulish realm, the mind, the will, the emotions, and the physical body. And if you let your body run rampant, you're going to be in a mess. I'll tell you that right now. Because your body wants things it shouldn't have. And a lot of people look at that and say, yeah, you know, you're talking about sexual sin. Well, yeah, uh, that's covered, obviously. But it's not just a lust for sexual sin. It can be a lust for money. The love of money, the Bible says, is the root of all evil, not the money itself, not the having the money, not the finances. It's the love, the desire, the inordinate desire for money to the exclusion of all else. There's people committing that sin don't have two pennies to rub together because they believe, see this is what, where it comes down to, they believe that if they had enough money, all their troubles would go away. See, and that's really not the answer. The answer is not the money. The answer is the relationship with God operating according to the Word and having Him supernaturally meet your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So that's where the area of confusion you know, comes from is because people look to the money. So finances could be a problem. There are people that look to education. Now there's nothing wrong with education. You know, I ended up going through school and getting a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and a doctoral degree and another doctoral degree and, and praise the Lord for education. I don't have any problem with that. But if that's all you're seeking and that's all that you identify as and it's all that defines who you are, then you have an inordinate desire for building up your mental realm. Now again, i got to be clear. There's nothing wrong with building your mental realm. There's nothing wrong with your mind. Because obviously the Word of God says in Romans chapter 12, we're to renew our mind to the Word of God. So there's nothing wrong with your mind being developed. It's what are you developing it on. We want to develop it on the Word. We want to develop it on truths from God's Word. Not just, you know... Now, you know, there's nothing wrong with nuclear physics. I don't have any particular affinity for it per se. Uh, you know, I've, I've looked into a few things, particularly quantum physics. I find it fascinating. Weird, but fascinating, you know. But if you look into some of those things, you can get a lot of information about physics and be very developed in that knowledge area. And what do you do with it if you're a regular, ordinary person? Now, if you teach physics or you have a doctorate in it or you're developing something that requires a deep understanding of physics, you know, that's a different story. But for most of us, we don't use that on a daily basis. It might be interesting. It might be fascinating to look into occasionally, but it's not really something that's going to help you day to day. Now, again, nothing wrong with it, but I'm just saying, where do you put your attention? That's the bottom line right there. Where do you put your attention? Do you put it on developing scholastically, mentally? Do you put it in developing physically? There's a lot of people that build their body up with weights and, and uh, develop muscles, and they know all the physiology, and they know how to develop muscle groups, and, and, all that. and there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, Paul said that physical exercise is profitable, but it is not profitable unto all things. He said godliness is profitable in all things. Again, nothing wrong with developing yourself physically. We should develop ourselves physically. I should develop myself physically. <laughs> but, again, not my area of expertise, <laughs> sadly. But the thing about it is, I do want to be more developed spiritually. I want to be studying the Word of God. I want to be taking my time, taking my effort, taking my attention. Keep coming back to that word attention. What you put first place. You know, really that's what it boils down to is what you put first place. If you put the Word of God first place, you're going to be studying the Word. You're going to be in the Word. You're going to be in fellowship. You're going to be coming to church. 
I know a lot of people. I've talked to them. Friends of mine. I don't have to go to church to be born again. No. You technically don't. But you know, it's kind of like uh, the person that was talking about jumping out of a plane. You don't have to have a parachute either, either but it sure helps. <laughs> well, it helps to go to church. <laughs> it helps to have that spiritual parachute of the, of the oversight of a pastor and the fellowship of like precious faith that we have in a church. You know, the Word of God says iron sharpens iron. Sometimes we don't quite understand that term or terminology. But basically what it is, how do you sharpen a knife? You sharpen a knife against a whetstone where you, sh you move that knife and you create friction. And it rubs that blade and gets it really finely honed and sharp. Iron can sharpen iron. Well, in the same way as believers together, you know, if I fellowship with Jerry, he sharpens me, I sharpen him. You put us together and get us fellowshipping together, we sharpen one another. And the same with everybody here. That's why it's important to come to church is to, to sharpen yourself. You know, get tuned up, so to speak, spiritually. And, of course, pastors here to help us and teach us and train us. And what we hear taught from him, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, then we develop in that area. And I thank God for that opportunity. I thank God that we've got somebody that's teaching us the Word of God on a consistent basis. I mean... I served as a pastor for many years back in the early 80s, and uh, my problem was I wasn't called as a pastor. <laughs> that was not my calling. I'm a teacher, and so I would teach. And really what we had was more of a teaching center. You know, people would come together, and I would teach, and they would hear and listen, and praise the Lord. But there really wasn't much of a pastoral anointing functioning. And so... It didn't grow and it didn't go like it really should have, that particular church. And it wasn't for lack of concern, wasn't for lack of trying, wasn't for lack of attention and, and thought, but it just wasn't my anointing. And it's always best to function where you're called and do what God's called you to do. You know, uh, look at it this way, it's kind of like specialties. Even doctors today, you, you don't see too many people that are just strict, you know, general practitioners that much anymore. Everybody has a specialty. Why? Because they've given that area, whatever their specialty is, particular attention. They have applied themselves more in that area. Maybe as a podiatrist, they study feet and how feet are put together, how the muscles work, and how the bones function, and all of that. And they become experts in feet. And so that is their specialty. And it's the same way with, uh, with us. We ought to function where we're called to function. If we do that, you'll find it's a whole lot better. I mean, once I understood that I was a teacher and operated in the helps ministry, and that that was my calling, oh, it just got so much better. <laughs> So much easier to do what you're called to do, you know, and not try to be something I wasn't. You know, there was a time, <laughs> pastor talks about this, back in the 70s and 80s, seemed like everybody wanted to be a pastor, uh, wanted to be a, a, a prophet or a teacher. Prophet or teacher. And I went through a little phase there where I thought, well, I must be a prophet or a teacher, uh, and teacher. And come to find out I wasn't a prophet. And if I tried to get over into that area, it was kind of like, but my head against a wall. And so I said, okay, okay, okay. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to just be me. God called me to be me. And I'm going to do what God called me to do. And now that I'm doing that, oh my, it's just so much easier. It's so much better. And there, I have a lot more success at doing what God's called me to do. And it's the same way for all of us. Don't try to be something you're not. And that all comes back to this area of genuine Christianity, but let's, let's, that, I've kind of digressed a bit. Let's kind of reel back here a bit, and let's talk about why people have itching ears and get off into these little areas. Um, 
I begin to meditate on that, and I begin to seek the Lord and say, now, Lord, what is it that's driving people to find these doctrines that are unscriptural that are not genuine Christianity? That's really what it boils down to. What, what are these, some of these that we're going to talk about a little later on, uh, these doctrines, and there's, you know, I just put together a little short list of them. There's a lot of them. <laughs> but my list here, for instance, here's one that's prevalent today, that tithing isn't for today. Everybody wanting to resist tithing. And so I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, why are people resisting tithing? Now, just a little background here. My dad taught Sunday school in the Southern Baptist Church his entire adult life. And he was an excellent teacher of what he knew, praise the Lord. That's really all you can teach is what you know. And so he, he taught, but one of the things he taught was tithing. And the pastor had him get up on a Sunday morning one time and come in and teach on tithing, just, you know, for a few minutes, a special section, you might say, of the, of the service. And what Dad did, see, as a kid, I saw him prepare for this at home. He had a stack of silver dollars, the old big silver dollars, you know, the heavy ones. And uh, he had a stack of 10 of them. And so he got those together and took them in with him that Sunday morning. And when the pastor invited him to come up, he got up on the, the platform, got on the po at the podium, and he just took his silver dollars and started stacking them one at a time. And everybody's watching him do that. And he stacked up a stack of 10 silver dollars. And he said, now here's 10 silver dollars. All God requires is this one right off the top. And he held it up where everybody could see it. And, of course, the silver dollar is big enough that people could see it even from the back, you know. And he said, that's all he requires. He, can, he allows you to keep that rest of that stack. Now, what's wrong with that? And, you know, when I saw that as a kid, I went, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and he said, the thing is, he said, he says that's his whether you give it to him or not. And then he flipped over to Malachi chapter 3, and he read where it says that he told the children of Israel, uh, you are robbing me. And the children of Israel said, how are we robbing you? And he said, in tithes and offerings. And Dad said, now the Lord says that tithe is his. If you don't give it to him, you're robbing God. And uh, that stuck with me as a kid. And so my whole life, from that point on, I believed in tithing. I mean, hey, praise the Lord. My dad taught it. It's in the Bible. He read the Bible. I saw it. And so I tithed when I didn't have much money. I tithed before I even had a job to tithe with, you know, before I had much increase. If I'd get in a buck, I'd take 10 cents out. The first fruits, the first 10 cents. I'd take that out of that buck, and I'd give the 10 cents and keep the 90 cents. And I just did that and did that. When I finally got a job, I tithed and on through the years. And now here I am. I'll be 68 the end of November. And I've been tithing my whole life. And it's amazing the financial blessing that I've seen. And, you know, the, the miraculous things that have happened financially for me through the years. Because I'm a tither and a giver. Now here's another thing that Dad said. He said, until you give God that first 10%, you haven't given anything yet. See, he said, get your, technology, your terminology right. You pay the tithe to God, that's His. If you choose to give beyond that, that's when you get into offerings. And so, you know, until you've done that first tithe, you haven't given really. You paid it, but you haven't given. <laughs> and again, he made that clear, and so I got it, got it, okay. And so I would begin to give beyond the tithe. Well, as a tither and a giver, praise the Lord, the Word of God says he rebukes the devourer for your sake. And so I began to have financial blessing, just all kinds of things. I mean, even when I was a kid, my dad got uh, let go <laughs> from... Mill's home where he worked, uh, he had to have open heart surgery. 
and they had had an employee that had some physical issues and it cost them a lot of money and they're a nonprofit organization and so they saw that he was having some problems and they said uh, hey, Mr. Bailey we, uh, we're going to have to let you go we, we don't want to have that kind of situation again well dad was not happy about that because he had lived at Bill's home his whole life and then he worked there right after he got out of the Navy and he'd been working there for 30 years or longer and then they turn around and say we want you out of here well dad being dad he left that day. <laughs> he got all his stuff together, put it in the car, and left <laughs> with me in tow, you know, me and mom. And he had a place down on High Rock Lake, and we went down there. Well, you know, I was a kid. I didn't understand really what was going on. But what was going on is he didn't have a job. He didn't have any retirement. He didn't, have, he didn't go on welfare. He didn't have any way to meet our needs of, for the family. But he'd been tithing and giving his whole life. And so he planted a garden. And we started getting stuff out of the garden and, and eating what we could out of that. And, and we did fine there for, I don't know, almost a year with nothing. I mean, you know, I say nothing. We had plenty, you know, in terms of eating and all that. But it was all stuff that was grown there on the property. And so... Uh, this is where tithing and giving and rebuking the devourer really comes in play. Because a friend of his came down and says, Frank, how's it going? He said, oh, we're doing fine. That's all he'd ever say. And uh, he said, well, how are you earning a living? He says, I, I can't work. They, I'm disabled now with my heart condition, and they fired me, and, you know, we're just living down here at the lake. And so this gentleman, Albert Bray, a friend of Dad's from years ago, he worked for the Veterans Administration. And he said, let me do some checking. Well, he did some checking and come to find out that Dad had, had left the Navy with a, an honorable discharge and a service-connected disability. He'd had a heart problem on board ship, and they didn't know what to do with him. He actually had uh, rheumatic fever. And they put him to bed for a few days and then put him back to work. Well, it had damaged his heart valve. And so it was service-connected disability. Well, Dad didn't know anything about that, but Albert Ray did because he worked for the VA. And he told him, Frank, you've got service-connected. You, you should get all your uh, needs taken care of through the, through the Navy, through the VA. Well, because of that, not only did he get money each month, and as Dad would like to say, he says, man, I'm doing better in retirement than I had when I was working, <laughs> you know. Like I said, the Mills Home didn't pay him a whole lot, you know, provided him room and board and milk, because <laughs> they had cows there on the, the campus. Uh, but, you know, they didn't pay a whole lot, but now here's the Navy and through the VA is paying him. And so when it came time for me to go to college, Mr. Bray said, now you've got, a, you got your way paid, through that, you, you know, you don't, you won't have to pay a dime to go to college. That'll all be taken care of, and uh, they'll even give you a monthly allowance to buy your books and everything else. Well, see again, the, the devourer was rebuked for our sake. We, all our needs got met, and my needs got met, and my college was paid for. All through this, now, God didn't cause his heart troubles. He didn't cause all this to happen. He didn't get dad fired. But all of those things that looked negative turned around and turned into a blessing and, and, a, and was positive because of being a tither and a giver. Because of the devourer being re rebuked for uh, his sake as a tither and a giver. So we need to understand that what we believe and what we stand on and what the Word of God says actually impacts us every single day as it did us in our finances, in our situation growing up. And I've had time and time and time again that I've seen that kind of thing happen. So, uh, you know, Dad was quite a character. I can tell stories on him all day long, but uh, 
one of the things he would do, he didn't know a whole lot about faith like we know about faith and words and speaking, but he decided there at the lake he had an acre of land that he had bought uh, back in, in the 50s, 1953. He paid $500 for half an acre, and his buddy paid $500 for the other half acre, and they went in together. And so that acre of land cost him $1,000. And then they built a little, you know, uh, cabin out of cinder block, and he paid 50 cents apiece for the cinder block in Thomasville, and they built it by hand. And uh, so he had all of that down there. And as, as time went by, and the VA started making, you know, those monthly payments and everything. He started adding a little here and adding a little there and a boathouse and a, a shop where he could work and, and work on his projects and things like that. And it built up this whole thing there on that property. And uh, like he said, he did better there than he did before when he was working full time. But anyway, he took a notion. <laughs> He took a notion he'd like to have the property up behind the house. There was six acres of land back there. And so what he did, he didn't have any money to buy it, but he would go up there and he would walk around the property. And he'd say, I'm going to have this property. I'm going to buy this property. It's my property. I'm going to have this property. And he'd take you up and show you what he was going to do. I'm going to build a tractor shed over here. I'm going to do this over here. And he'd tell you all about it. And you were a captured audience. You, <laughs> you had to listen to him. Yeah, okay, okay. And he'd tell you all that. He did that for years. Well, the people that owned the property were his next door neighbors. And they had 20, 30 acres. I mean, they owned a lot of property back in there. And I'm sure... Somewhere along the line, they got word that he wanted that property. Well, Dad, without saying anything about it or asking him anything about it or anything like that, he would just mow their land. And he just did that every week. He'd mow their land. He had a ride mower, and so he'd get out there, he'd mow it. Well, they came to him one day and said, Frank, uh, you know, you've been taking care of all this property, and we know you'd really like to have it. We just want to give it to you. They gave him six acres of property behind his house. So now he had seven acres on High Rock Lake and no money crossed hands. See, I mean faith in operation. And he didn't, he didn't think about it that way. He didn't say, I'm, I'm going to believe God and I'm going to put my... He just did what you do <laughs> when you walk in faith. And so I saw that happen time and time again. If he wanted a new car, he never would borrow money. He didn't like borrowing money. But he said, I'm going to have a new car. Yep, going to have a new car. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the Ford place, find me a new car. He'd find one. He'd say, that's it. Well, Dad, you going to get you a loan? Nope. Just going to squirrel some money back. He'd squirrel a little back each month. And then one day, you, by the time you pretty much forgot about it, uh, he'd say, come on with me, we're going to town. All right, so we got the car, we took off, and he, he took me to town, he pointed out a red station wagon, Ford station wagon, and he said, uh, I, that's, that's our car. I said, yeah, I like it, it's nice. He says, well, play with it, let me know what you think. So I played with the radio, and I did a few things. I said, yes, it's this nice car. He said, I like it because it's a red wagon. I want my little red wagon. I said, well, good for you. He said, come on with me. So he goes in, he tells the guy, he says, I want that car. Ah, right, we'll set up the payments, we'll do that. He says, no, I said I want the car, I'm paying cash. He'd squirreled the money back and he bought it cash. Now granted, this was back far enough that that brand new Ford station wagon only cost him about $2,000, but he'd stuck back the $2,000 to get it. <clears throat> and he had that car for years. Loved that little car, his little red wagon. But see, that's the way he lived. That's the way he operated. That's, that's his modus operandi, you know. And to me, that's genuine Christianity. Just doing what the Word of God says. He didn't have six steps to this or seven steps to that. You know what I'm saying? 
He didn't have tape series he listened to and on and on and on and going to believe God. He didn't do any of that. He just said what he was going to do, put his faith on it without even knowing what he was doing, and then applied himself by sticking some money back until he had the money to pay for whatever it was. He bought a boat that way. He, he, I, just amazing things. And so as I grew up, I never felt like that we were underprivileged. Even that year that we went without any finances coming in, I was a kid, I, as far as I knew, everything was fine. You know? But the thing is, what do you apply yourself to? What do you listen to? What are you putting your faith on? You know, it's a lot of times I look at how people think about faith these days, and they, they look at it as you put your coin in the vending machine and God spits something out, and you, you, you expect it instantly. You know, I'm going to get my healing now. I'm going to get my new car now. Well, a lot of times, the way it's done is over time. You know, I mean, when I came out of the hospital, uh, doctors told me I had a week to live. I came out of the hospital. I started confessing my healing and believing in God, and uh, it didn't look good there for a while. But I began to amend, and I got a little better, and a little better, and a little better, and a little better. And there are plenty of examples in the Bible where when someone or it was healed as they went, it was called this second miracle that Jesus did, still a miracle, even though it took time, even though there was time involved. So don't look at it as put the coin in the vending machine and get it out immediately, and that's the miracle. The miracle is that it happened for you in the first place. You know, I got out of the hospital, I got healed. Praise the Lord. Belinda got healed. Praise the Lord. Now, you know, again, there was time involved, but it's still a miracle. pastor talks about his toe. Supernatural miracle. There's been all kinds of things. Getting into this building, supernatural miracle. Of finances, even. Well, praise the Lord. We've seen all that. We've, we know all of that. And it's not a, a, about punching the punches of this step, that step, the other step. It's a lifestyle. It's expecting the Word to work. Brother Hagin talked about uh, the Word works when you put it to work. And unfortunately, there's a whole lot of Christians that aren't putting the Word to work. They know what should be happening. They know the Scriptures. They've got head knowledge, but they hadn't put it in their heart. And, you know, Jesus expects us to use our faith. He expects us to walk by faith and live by faith. And, uh, I mean, you think about the man that came to Jesus and said, I brought my son to your disciples, and they prayed for him, and nothing happened. Well, if you can do anything, will you help us? And you notice Jesus didn't say, well, now, uh, not everybody gets healed. He didn't make any excuses. He didn't even say, now this is... this, this is." shock your theology if, if you're of that persuasion, is that he didn't say, now you shouldn't have come to the disciples. They don't have any power here on the earth. You should have come to me. I'm the one that can heal. Now, based on a lot of theology these days, again, not genuine Christianity, but what people think is true theologically, they think, well, now that's true. Now, Jesus is the only one that could do it. No. You notice what Jesus did? He got put out. Go back and read it. He said, you faithless generation. How, am I, how long am I going to have to put up with you guys? Now, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, taking out the King James. But he expected the disciples to handle it. Amen. So it wasn't that Jesus was the only one that could do it. What did he say was the problem? Oh, ye of little faith. It was where their faith was, or lack thereof. He told them it was because of their unbelief was the reason that the guy's son was not healed. 
Jesus talked to the father there for a few minutes, ministered to the kid, and he was completely healed. So it wasn't that it, he, it wasn't his time. It wasn't that it, it wasn't God's will. It obviously was. Well, then why didn't he get healed when the disciples prayed? Because of their unbelief. They didn't operate on faith. And it always comes back to that. And see, that's the part that people don't want to hear. <laughs> people with the itching ears. You mean it's my faith? I'm going to have to believe God? I'd rather you believe God, Brother Bill. Well, I'm sure you would, but you're going to have to believe. You're going to have to apply your faith. That's what God expects, particularly of those of us that have a few years under our belt, <laughs> spiritually speaking. God expects that of us. He expects us to operate by faith. Now, praise the Lord when the minister comes through and lays hands on them and there's a supernatural you know, uh, uh, sign and wonder, and they get healed that way. That's great. But very often, if you look at that situation, the person that was healed that way tends to be a young, immature believer. You know, and if they are a mature believer that does have some understanding of the Word of God, it, it tends to be them using their faith. So, that's not comfortable for a lot of folks. They'd much rather say, well, now, you know, I just believe if, if you had the ointment, <laughs> if you had the anointing, well, I, you could lay hands on me and I'd be healed, but you must not have it. That's what the guy told Brother Hagin. He said, well, now, you know, Amy Simple McPherson laid hands on me and I got healed low those many years ago, but now I went to Jack Coe, he didn't have it. And I went to Oral Roberts, he didn't have it. Now you've laid hands over, you don't have it. Now you mean Simple McPherson had it at one time, but I went back to her, she doesn't have it now. And Brother Hagin said, that's not the problem. The problem is you got healed by a miracle early on under Amy Simple McPherson's ministry, yes, but you should have been in the Word all these years since. And you need to get it on your faith. He said, just come to the meetings and come to the daily meetings and stay in the Word. This is back when Brother Hagin would camp and stay for like three weeks at a time at a church. And he said, just come to the meetings every day, listen to the Word. And Brother Hagin taught on healing, taught on healing, taught on healing. And finally the guy came to him in the healing line. And Brother Hagin told him, don't even get in the healing line till, till I say you can. But he came up in the healing line one day. He said, Brother Hagin, I'm going to receive my healing. You lay hands on me and I'll get it. Well, Brother Hagin perceived he had faith to be healed. Remember when Paul did that? He perceived he had faith to be healed. He laid hands on him. Guy got healed just like that. Praise the Lord. He got it on his faith. Because he developed in his faith. Genuine Christianity operates when you develop yourself. And you put your attention on the Word of God. And these doctrines like tithing isn't for today. Why does that happen? It happens because people want to spend the money on what they want. You know, I don't want to give that to God. God's got money. I want to keep it. See, it's the flesh. It's really, when you get right down to it, lasciviousness. Now, that's a big, long theological word. But that's really what it is, lasciviousness. What is lasciviousness? Well, the definition is excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. Now, again, most people's mind goes to sexual stuff and all that. But again, it's what is a pleasure to you, whatever that might be. Spending money. A lot of people are excited about spending money. A lot of people are excited about sports. A lot of people are excited about other things. Whatever you indulge in excessively. There's nothing wrong with sports. Nothing wrong with spending money. But it's what you do excessively. So excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. Another aspect of this is having a complete disregard for the integrity and honor of others. Oh, 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 oh. You got to have it because you want it, and it doesn't matter if it hurts or impacts anybody else. That's lasciviousness. 
And the Bible says that lasciviousness is something as a believer you do not want to participate in. Okay? And there's plenty of examples of that. Uh, let me give you just a few scriptures. Boy, I'm, I'm all over the place here. Uh, let's look at Mark chapter 7, verse 20. Jesus is teaching here, and he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So you don't want that. Now, you know, as I was reading through that list, I, I came across the one, that, an evil eye. And a lot of people think, you know, the evil eye is some, some something people do and they put a, a hoodoo on you, you know. or what, That's not what it's talking about. An evil eye is to meditate or put your attention on evil all the time. In other words, you have an eye for evil. <laughs> your attention is on evil things. And that's what he's talking about there. So, you know, we read that in the King James, an evil eye, and our mind goes into other weird areas, but that's not really what he's saying. He's saying that if you are meditating on those evil things, that gets over into this area that is defiling to the man. One of those was lasciviousness, this inordinate desire. And this whole anti-tithing doctrine comes down to, I want to spend it on me, 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 me. It's, you know, I want it for my flesh. Same thing is true about uh, other areas. Let me look at some of these other examples I had. Tithing isn't for today. Personal holiness isn't necessary. I can live like I want to live. I can do whatever I want to do. And I'm pre-forgiven because of greasy grace. <laughs> I like to call it greasy grace because if you're not careful, you'll slide into that doctrine. You know, nothing wrong with grace. Real grace is awesome. But unfortunately, greasy grace is where you have an occasion to the flesh. Galatians 5.13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. See, there's a whole lot of people that have an occasion to the flesh because of that, that, again, that lasciviousness, that lust after things they want. Got to be them and what they want. Well, you need to be loving and serving one another. Remember part of that definition was having a complete disregard for the integrity and honor of others? If you have a regard for the integrity and honor of others, it'll keep you out of this mindset. You're not looking for you. You're looking for helping other people. And that will be something that will keep you out of this mindset. Uh, church attendance is not required. Now the Bible says that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Not to forsake means go. <laughs> be there. But why would you say, well I don't have to go to church because you want to do something else. And that's for you, and it's, it's good. you feel good about taking some time off and doing what you want to do. In other words, massaging the flesh again. All of these areas that I've got this list of here all comes back to this lasciviousness. This idea that I'm in it for me. Or we shouldn't be in it for us. We should be in it to help others, bless others, and bring others up spiritually. Praise the Lord. Now, I think we... I'm going to stop right here. I think we've gotten into a few things, and I think it'd be good for us just to meditate on this, ponder this, and maybe next week we'll come back and hit some other areas. But we need genuine Christianity. We don't need these false doctrines. We don't need to be distracted. We need to keep our attention on the Word, keep our doctrine straight, hear the Word of God consistently on a, on a regular basis, 
and, and you will be so blessed. You'll see things happen. I'm still amazed at the blessings that God is pouring out on all of us. We all have testimonies of the awesome things God has done in our lives. And it's usually because we were paying attention to the Word of God. And we were living what we know to live and doing what we know to do. Praise the Lord. Amen. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, uh, let's receive our offering. Uh, Brother Joe's got that where he can help you with that. There's uh, offering envelopes in the seats, seats right there in front of you. Those of you online, if you want to contribute to Expedition Church of the Triad, you can always uh, use the online services that we have. You can use Square Cash, uh, which is uh, exp dollar sign Expedition Triad. Or if you want to contribute through PayPal, you can use give at expeditiontriad.org and uh, you can contribute as well if you'd like to. Those of us that are here, uh, we're just going to receive the offering, and uh, then after that we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and receive from your word. We thank you, Father, that as we give, we give into the gospel. We believe for a return on our giving. We thank you, Father, that we have opportunity to give and that you rebuke the devourer for our sake as tithers and as givers, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Joe, you go ahead and receive that. Be, uh, be sure to come on out to uh, Expedition Church of the Triad, those of you online, and receive here in person. I'm glad we are able to go on the air and uh, share the services electronically, but it's always good to be here live and in person. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. All right, well, we'll go ahead and shut down our live feed here tonight. And remember, until next time, to fulfill the Word of God.